Welcome to Hastening the Day of God, a space to make sense of what being a Christian really is. This is the seventh installment of a series on the Gospel of Mark. The title for today's presentation is Teaching Disciples. The theme verse reads, When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark 8, 34. Let's remember that discipleship is the second step in the process of being a light bearer. The first one is just to be a follower. In other words, we follow Jesus to get back to God, our only way to recover the eternal life we lost in Eden. As followers, then we have the option to become disciples. In other words, students, trainees, apprentices, pupils. Once we complete our course, we are sent to invite others to become disciples. So training, receiving the proper instruction, is extremely important. Jesus' life was one of teaching. He showed us the true character of God. Previously, we have seen how Jesus' students, his disciples, struggled to understand that God's offer was for the whole human race, not only for the Jews. With that in mind, he took them to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and then to Decapolis. Grasping the true character of God is of extreme importance. Otherwise, we might end up teaching a distorted picture of God. In addition to relieving sickness, suffering, and even death, all and every miracle performed by Jesus was intended as a teaching tool for his students. It is the same for us. We need to fully understand the true character of God so we can share him correctly. In previous chapters, we have seen how Jesus was able to heal deaf and mute people or to give sight to the blind as long as they were willing to be healed. However, Jesus wasn't able to open his students' spiritual eyes unless they were willing to allow him. In Mark 8, 17 and 18, Jesus asks his trainees how it is possible that having eyes, ears, and intellect they haven't seen, heard, and discerned. Is it because their hearts are so hardened? Healing this blind man in Bethsaida presented Jesus another opportunity to teach his pupils. This man was healed in two steps. First, the man responded as being able to see, though not clearly. The man fully recovered his vision after Jesus' second action. Spiritual vision often requires additional interaction with the Lord. Sometimes we think we see clearly already, but we don't really know how clear is clear. We need to persevere in God's Word. Asking questions is a way to start a conversation, engage students' attention, and reinforce their participation. After asking his disciples who other people thought he was, he lands the question directly at his apprentices. Peter answers with the now famous response, You are the Messiah, the Christ. Then, Jesus started teaching his trainees what being the Messiah meant. When that happened, Peter started rebuking Jesus. What a nerve! It was then when Peter was sharply rebuked by Jesus because he was looking God's ways the way Satan does, with such a distorted understanding of what being a Messiah is, saying that Jesus was the Messiah, Mark 8.29, would cause more harm than good. Mark 8.33, along with Matt 16.23, offers us a very interesting insight. What does Jesus call someone that sees godly things from a human perspective, instead of God's perspective? Jesus allowed people to antagonize him, argue with him. He tolerated insults. He endured physical injury without complaint. However, one thing he never allowed, obstructing, delaying the Father's plan for his life. Are we learning the lesson ourselves? Six days after Peter's acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah, and as part of their training, Jesus took the most prominent of his pupils to the mount where he was visited by Moses and Elijah. They came to strengthen Jesus for what was coming in a few more weeks. He wanted them to understand what being the Messiah is all about. The same way that he wants us to understand that unless we dedicate, consecrate our lives to his cause, we are just wasting our time. Nothing equals what God offers us. In Mark 8.31, Jesus told his students that he was going to be put to death. They didn't get it. Then again, in Mark 9, 9, after the transfiguration, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after his resurrection. They also seemed to ignore that. 
How many of us profess to be Jesus' followers but fail to pay attention to his words? Either we don't listen to his marching orders or we don't hear the cries for help of those perishing around us. In Mark 9, 30-41, he added an additional detail that he was going to be betrayed. In both cases, he tells them he was going to rise back to life after three days. They didn't get it either. They had one thing clear. Jesus was the Messiah, and they, as his close associates, will surely have a very prominent position in the new kingdom. So they were arguing who was the greatest among them. Here again, Jesus instructs his slow-learning disciples. Unless they get to understand that in God's kingdom, the greatest is the one that serves the most. God is the greatest because he serves the most. He is our creator, sustainer, provider, savior, and more. No one is greater than him because no one does more things for others. Do we understand now why a true disciple is born in God's kingdom as God's agent? Do we understand why joining God's mission is part of our own restoration? It is when we allow God's Spirit to dissolve our pride and selfishness and fill us up with love and genuine interest for others' salvation. Additionally, in Mark 9, 38-41, Jesus forbids sectarianism. In Mark 9, 42-50, Jesus reminds us that anything that disconnects us from God that boosts our ego leads to utter destruction. Like salt, we are to disperse God's influence to the world. If we don't, we lose our purpose. Being a Christian without announcing the goodness of God to the world is negating Christ. We won't get too far by doing that. We often say that Jesus is our example. Jesus entrusted us to take God's invitation to every person on earth, to participate everyone, to announce God's kingdom to everyone. While Jesus was on earth, nothing could sway him from his mission. Are we fully committed to God's agenda? Are we fully engaged in God's redemptive plan? Are we part of God's solution? Or with our inaction, are we choosing the enemy's side? Putting Mark 8.38 in first person, If I want to save my life, I will destroy it. But if I give up my life for Jesus and for the gospel, which implies his mission, I will save it. 